Thank you uh, for the introduction, and I certainly want to thank CNE News for uh, providing this great opportunity, uh, both for myself and for my uh, research colleagues back at Vanderbilt. Um, so, um, you know, where today's story really starts is with a quote from my graduate school advisor, uh, Professor Gary Solikowski, back when I was a second year, uh, where in one of our subgroup meetings, he told everyone, you know, the thing about Townsend is that he would probably collaborate with a pineapple if he thought it would teach him how to be citrus. Um, and so, uh, where I, you know, I have no visions of being a pineapple, um, but I do really love collaborating um, because it brings together all of the lessons that I learned growing up in Detroit, which contrary to what Michelle might have told you is the greatest city in the United States. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, collaboration allows you to learn from people who are different than you are and gather and pool skill sets. Um, and so, by way of introduction, uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I was born and raised on the Lower East Side of Detroit. Uh, very close to the Detroit River, and thus just north of Windsor, Ontario. And um, I'm the oldest of uh, five siblings in a single parent home, and I'm a first generation college student. Now, uh, this is a photo of us back in um, you know, 1999, when I was an 18 year old uh, college, or excuse me, high school senior. And then for the sake of comparison, um, this is us, uh, you know, maybe 300 pounds heavier. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you crack a joke like that, because you know you're gonna pay uh, at some point. Uh, but, you know, this is a photo of my family and, uh, you know, we're, we're from the city. Um, but my mom always wanted us to learn lessons from other people who live a little bit differently. And so um, every summer she would send us down to her hometown, which is Springfield, Tennessee, uh, where we would hang out with my great grandmother and my great uncle. Now, the cool thing about our family, and we're really fortunate in this aspect, is that we are part of one to two percent of black Americans in the country uh, that can trace our ancestry back to the plantation and ultimately back to African soil. And so the photograph that I show you today is actually not of my great grandmother's home, uh, but it is of Wessington Plantation, uh, which at the time was the largest tobacco producing plantation in the United States. And this is where we descend from. Now, pretty cool. Um, just about six months ago, we were um, at Wessington and we got to visit some of the cemeteries. Um, and, um, you know, it was a really good time for my wife and my daughter. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, you know, you came to a chemistry symposium to hear chemistry. Uh, but Steve Townsend is bringing you face to face with this institution and showing you photos of his great, 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 great grandfather, Emmanuel and Hetty. Um, and I, I do this purposefully uh, because, uh, you know, when I was 13 years old, this was the first time I encountered these people. And they really taught me a lot of lessons that I've carried with me um, ever since those um, early days. And so this was probably one of the most powerful moments of my adolescence. Now, the hard work and perseverance I learned from learning about their lives. I ultimately carried forward with me. Um, I graduated from Martin Luther King High School in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I went on to Oakland University, a medium-sized public school just north of Detroit, um, about 22,000 students. Now, uh, you know, being a first-generation college student, uh, right, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, but what I found um, during my career is that people find you when you're in need. And so in this case, uh, one of the first people I've met um, was a lifelong friend and colleague, uh, Professor Kathy Moore. Uh, she's a phenomenal biochemist, and she actually uh, brought me into her lab as a first year undergraduate, um, which was really cool because I didn't even know that I would need a job, right? So she um, set me up for the first year of my uh, academic career. And after working with Professor Moore for a year, uh, she brought me into her office for a hard conversation, and she uh, told me straight up she thought I was pipelining towards science, um, but that she couldn't help me become a black scientist. And so we were very fortunate at the time that uh, Professor Amanda Bryan Friedrich was in the department. And so I ended up working with Amanda for three years and three summers. And ultimately, she taught me everything I know about organic chemistry. Now, in addition to working with these uh, fantastic women in science, uh, I was pretty fortunate that I met with Toya. Um, so this is my you know, great friend, my wife, my lifelong collaborator. Uh, and we've collaborated on two great projects thus far, uh, <laughs> you know, these two people. Uh, you know, and she's right there, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, even though you're clapping, there will be no more projects. Uh, so, so this is it. Uh, so, uh, you know, from there, uh, from Oakland, I moved on to uh, Vanderbilt University. Uh, and what attracted me to Vanderbilt um, during my first uh, stint there was really the aspect or the idea that you could become um, a fundamentalist uh, in your core area, right? You can learn everything about becoming an organic chemist, um, but you, that there were no boundaries, right? We weren't boxed in. Um, and so ultimately, during my time at Vanderbilt, I worked with Professor Gary Solikowski. He taught me um, everything just about um, organic chemistry and how to make and break bonds. And um, I think equally important as to working with Gary and then ultimately Craig Lindsley for a little while, 
uh, was that I was able to meet a lot of great friends. Uh, a lot of them aren't pictured in the presentation today, um, but this is a um, mini reunion at a previous ACS conference. Now, um, after departing Vanderbilt, I moved on, um, like a number of people um, in this year's class, to Columbia University, uh, where I work with Professor Sam Danishevsky. And so everything that I do as a faculty member today on a day-to-day -day basis, I learned from Sam and Sarah Danishevsky. Uh, this was the first time that I wrote a paper. This was the first time that I saw what a grant looked like. Um, this was the first time that I really um, learned how to manage people. And so I'm really thankful for all of the opportunities that Sam and Sarah provided, um, specifically, that we are you know, now part of the Danishevsky family. And so wherever you are in the United States or in the world, there's at least 1,500 other Danishevsky alumni in arm's reach. Uh, and so this has been a, a very powerful resource. Now, um, how does this relate to what we do scientifically? Um, well, if I could paint the picture for you, um, you could picture Latoya and I um, shortly after she graduated from Columbia um, with her master's degree in social work. Uh, we're walking through Harlem, 125th Street, the epicenter of black culture. And um, as we're walking and talking about the um, future um, parenting of Allison at the time, uh, I saw a poster uh, to the side that was advertising infant formula. Now for someone who was gonna be a new, um, soon to be new dad, this was pretty um, interesting to me because in a number of countries, you actually can't advertise formula. Now if you were to just drop down 70 blocks uh, into Manhattan, you're now in the 50s and so you're probably at the epicenter of wealth in the United States. And interestingly, you won't see any advertisements for formula, you instead see advertisements for breast milk. Now, um, you know, deep within, I'm actually a humanist rather than an organic chemist. And so, uh, you know, what I wanted to do was start to solve the problem and answer the question of why do we specifically market certain products to certain people based on how they look and how much money they make. Um, but because I need a job and I'm a trained organic chemist, uh, I decided to go about this project in a different way and to try to decipher what are the differences between human milk and infant formula, because if we could tease that apart, we could then provide something to the general public. So the first lesson that we learned when we think about the differences between human milk and infant formula um, really start with the fact that whereas formula is sterile, human milk is living, okay? And so if we think about every person in this room by way of background, we all have somewhere around a half a pound of bacteria in and on our bodies. That colonization process starts the moment that you were born um, and it is based on the method of delivery. So whether you're delivered vaginally or through a planned C-section, you have very different microbes present in and on your body. Antibiotic use is incredibly important because we know that some 50% uh, of women in the United States who labor and deliver will receive an antibiotic during that event. Moreover, around 90% of babies in the United States will receive an antibiotic within the first 15 minutes of life. Yet it's very poorly understood what are the long-term outcomes on the microbiome to having antibiotics when you're first born. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is incredibly important. Uh, we know for emotional well-being, um, but we, what we really don't notice is that we actually pass on skin microbes to the baby during this event. And then of course, my group is interested in human milk science uh, and the fact that when mom breastfeeds her baby, she provides some 400 to 700 species of bacteria at every nursing event to the baby, um, which is the largest continuous source of good bacteria uh, really that we experience in our life. Now the second lesson that we learned when we think about the differences between breast milk and infant formula have to do with human milk oligosaccharides. So these are complex oligosaccharides that number somewhere around 200 or so um, that are present in human milk but not present in cow's milk and thus are not in infant formula. Now it's been well established in the community that these compounds are prebiotics. So if you think about what mom does, it's genius. I know a lot of people like me saying that. Uh, and so mom provides to her baby some 400 to 700 species of bacteria, most of which are good, in addition to food to feed the bacteria that are good, right? So it's an evolutionary genius. Now back in 2017, our group contributed to this area uh, by deciphering that these compounds possess antimicrobial activity, okay? So it's pretty interesting to think that it took really to 2017 to discover that these compounds were able to um, kill or at least uh, inhibit the growth of select pathogenic bacteria. Now, in this case, the past is prologue. Um, this is already um, sort of out in the literature. And so where we're headed in the future, at least for this project, are in three general directions. And this is what I'll close with. Uh, so the first really surrounds this idea of not breaking breast milk. So if I could paint a second picture for you, you know, you could picture yourself walking through the supermarket 
And when you make that left hand turn into the infant food product aisle, you will now start seeing products that contain a single human milk oligosaccharide known as 2-prime FL. Now when I speak to people in the industry, they're really excited because people are gonna make a lot of money off of these compounds. Um, moreover, they're thinking that they're bringing infant formula closer to human milk. Uh, but I would argue, based on what we've observed in the lab, that they're not making formula closer to human milk, they're making formula closer to formula. So infant formula, right, is standardized. Every can is the same as every can. If we think about human milk, every batch is different based on what the baby needs. It's really personalized medicine and mom continuously evolves her milk to give the baby what they need in that moment. So how are we gonna address this problem of, in, or of industry standardizing milk? Well, my colleagues really want to characterize the activity of as many human milk oligosaccharides as possible, and then ultimately correlate those to the specific needs of specific babies, so that one day when you go to the supermarket, you don't see one product where everything is identical, but maybe you see 50, so that you can pick out the product that's best for your child. Second area that we really wanna work, uh, work under is making antibiotics better. If we think about antibiotics, right, this is one of the um, best inventions for modern medicine, but we know that they're starting to lose their effectiveness. We've previously demonstrated that if you co-dose select antibiotics with human milk oligosaccharides, isolated directly from mother's milk, that you can increase the efficiency and effectiveness of that antibiotic. And so where we're going in the future is that we're gonna tackle antibiotic resistance. We're gonna start beating resistance uh, in select bacteria by doing the same trick of co-dosing human milk oligosaccharides with poorly effective antimicrobial agents. And then in the final uh, stage, we're gonna focus on improving big kid health. Uh, you know, so my kid has been in my office for the last three weeks, uh, so my language is starting to morph into her language. Um, she would be pretty happy with this slide, though. Uh, and so if we, if we think about antibiotics as we close out, um, antibiotics are still the most um, prescribed drug to children. What if we didn't have to do that? What if instead we could really mimic what goes on inside of our own microbiome and begin to really characterize the communication system between good bacteria and bad bacteria, and, st and instead of dosing every child with a um, antibiotic when they have an infection, we can instead dose them with human milk oligosaccharides in combination with good bacteria to handle an infection. And so you'll hear more from that, uh, or from us on that in the future. And so with that, I just want to thank a few people. Um, the first are the funding agencies, both internal and externally, who have supported our research. I really want to thank the women who have donated milk to this project. It is asking a lot of someone to provide you milk when they've just given a baby. Um, and so we're thankful for those uh, contributions. Uh, Professor Jen Gaddy has really enabled this program by uh, being a great friend and collaborator, and I'm forever uh, indebted to her for her um, assistance. And then of course, uh, you know, this isn't about me. This is about uh, this cast of characters. And so, um, you know, I'm really fortunate. Uh, I've gotten some of the best graduate students that you could ever encounter. Um, a lot of them work on pure organic synthesis. Uh, but for this project, I really want to thank Dorothy. Uh, brave soul, she decided to work on a microbiology project in an organic chemistry lab. Um, you know, so kudos to her. Uh, Kelly Kraft took this project to um, just exciting levels, and she added a level of rigor that we didn't even know we needed because we're an organic chemistry lab. Rebecca Moore. Um, is responsible for really discovering a lot of novel uses with these molecules. And then of course, Skylar Chambers is gonna be the next great academic out of our lab. And she's gonna work on um, securing the mechanism of action of these compounds in the near future. And with that, I love to not take any questions. <laughs>